how many movies have the word poop in like <laughs> red paint on a white wall that looks like blood? It Not says, enough. It says poop. I thought it was poo. It was just, is it? It's poop. I'm seeing uh, P O O P. So anyway, all I'm saying is motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> <laughs> it's one Sorry. fucking hour time. I am Evan Husney. This is, of course, the show where we have just one fucking hour to talk about one goddamn movie. And uh, joined, of course, here we got uh, to my left. We got Tom Fitzgerald, Big T. What's going on? Hi, guys. I'm uh, I'm facing one of my greatest fears, which is trying to discuss this film in an, under an hour and uh, <laughs> I'm shaking in my boots yeah, right. the challenge. So here we go. Let's go. Here we go. We maybe this, Hold my hand. Maybe the spray bottle will make a triumphant <laughs> return tonight. We will see. Okay. Uh, and to my right, we got, of course, as always, Mr. Marcus Herring. Marcus, what's going on? What's up, everybody? What is this? This is like our... Uh, what number episode is this? It's like 90... This is uh, 99. 99 Luft Balloons. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> episode 99 of the program. Unbelievable. Wow. We are so close to episode 100. That'll be next week. And uh, we have something special lined up for next week. Uh, but before we get into that, what we what are we talking about tonight, guys? We are talking about uh, Nicholas Rogue and Donald Camel's performance... From 1970, this is a big movie. I know for both you guys, so I'm very excited. Um, this kind of continues our Fugue Festival that we've sort of been having uh, <laughs> over the past two weeks, mm -hmm. uh, where we talked about Three Women, Robert Altman's flick uh, with 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 Raimi uh, um, a, a few weeks back, and now we're continuing the themes of you know doppelganger doubling, you know. Um, and a freak identity out identity swapping identity swapping and vampirism <laughs> identity vampirism we're getting into tonight so <laughs> really excited about that this is a big one so uh, strap in we're getting into performance tonight but we got to also plug next week guys um, so episode 100 a lot we had kicked around a lot of different ideas wanting to do something special for this milestone um and i think we arrived at something pretty uh this will be interesting so tom was mentioning earlier before we started recording there are a lot of you know when these shows when a lot of you know hit shows such as ours uh you know reaches a milestone <laughs> such like you know like this uh we tend to look back into the archives look pa look back over the last several years and see what are the greatest moments from the show <laughs> So we're going to engage in a uh, one fucking hour on one fucking hour next week, which will be clip, clip show, clip, clip show. show, clip show. Um, <laughs> our favorite moments from the program uh, over the past three years, which is crazy. Um, and but we want to hear from you, uh, the one fucking hour fan. Yeah. Uh, let us know what have, what were your favorite moments, uh, moments, perhaps uh, times on the show. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna bring them up. We're gonna watch them live <laughs> on the program. So tell us your favorite moments. Comment and, and below. Comment on them. Yeah. And, uh, and underneath, we're gonna have uh, like time of your life, <laughs> right? Get some Green Day up in here. <laughs> <Yeah>. Nothing. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Uh, <laughs> Let's do oh, it on your side of the screen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Sure. Had the time. It's going to be like, uh, you know, on those clip shows, like all those sitcoms, like Growing Pains or uh, uh, Seinfeld or whatever, they would do the clip shows right. for like, yeah. uh, uh, to kind of phone it in, right? So they, they didn't have to show up. They just kind of yeah. do a, ah, yeah. I just run a clip. It's, it's going to be a lot of more work for us, though, because we have to sit through and watch uh, a yeah. hundred hours of us yes. talking, right? Totally. Well, but also we're, you know, we're, we're yeah. opening it up to folks uh, who want to crowdsource this a bit. And if you have any. Yeah. Little moments that are, uh, you know, Near and indelible yeah. in your yeah. mind. <laughs> if, if you do, any favorite moments over the last three years from one fucking Cherished. hour? Yeah, that you cherish. Please comment below on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube with your favorite moments because we definitely want to... We Cue wanna... tumbleweeds <laughs> I know. across the... Uh, 
I'm in totally, section. Totally, totally, <laughs> totally. But if you have any, we'll take them. Uh, otherwise, we're going to put together our favorite uh, highlights. Uh, I know I have a few already of just you know, some I of my can't wait. favorite uh, moments yeah. from, from the past <laughs> 99 episodes. So anyway, that'll be fun next week for our 100th episode. One fucking yeah. hour on one yeah. fucking hour. Very excited about that. Let's do it. Also, quick shout out to the Patreon, patreon.com slash one fucking hour. We've had a couple of signups here in the last few weeks, which is awesome. Um, mm-hmm. If you want access to any of our bonus material, any of our feature length audio commentaries, we'll probably have a new bonus episode that we'll try to also maybe coincide with the the uh, 100th episode. So if you want access to that, the only way to get it is uh, up on patreon.com slash one fucking hour. Or if you're on YouTube and you want to keep all your, your content shit in one place, uh, just uh, click uh, underneath the video. There's the click the join button and you can become a moment of the channel. Same max, same perks, same price, five bucks a month. And we appreciate your support. Thank you, everybody who signed up so far. Yeah, man. Super awesome. Um, all right. Are you guys ready to get into this? Fucking performance, man. As, as ready as I'll ever be. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be. I said before, it's. Uh, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I almost wanted to cancel today. I was like, <laughs> you know, weird. I think I've been passive aggressively avoiding uh, really pressing for this film. Okay. You know, because sure. um, it's not even like, oh, I love this film to death, although I kind of do. It's just I'm simply so knowledgeable mm. and so feverishly excited about the minutia that uh, surrounds and, and is inside this film. Right. That I just keep going, you know, and like I'm, I just, I'm on my second book about the film, you know, that kind of thing. So, oh yeah, I thought I liked like, it, it, but it's a little uh, gnarly for me. It's like, it's like yeah, oh, it's, it's too much. This is a this is a crazy challenge, as we alluded to last week. The absurd task of fitting it all into an hour. That's what we signed up for, but we're going to try and do it. So um, let's l- let's give it a go here and see uh, <laughs> see how it goes. All right, so I'm going to start this clock. Uh, you guys ready? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. Wait, it was daylight saving, so does that mean we get an extra uh, hour? An extra yeah. hour, right? Yeah. So it's like it goes spring, and then, for, yeah. spring forward. Yeah, spring right. forward an hour, so there's two hours. Right, okay, right. It's two hours. <laughs> Let's oh hit that clock. Here we go. All right. All right. And uh, starting the clock now. All right, boom, here we go. All right, just a little um background information here on the movie. Tough movie to summarize, put it that way. Um <laughs> But uh, all these Fugue State Festival films are hard to encapsulate in a little synopsis. But this one is from Time Out London um, that I I pulled here. It's a little lengthy, but I think it covers the basis on what the movie is about if you're not familiar. So Donald Camel and Nicholas Rogue's performance is a virtuoso juggling act which manipulates its visual and verbal imagery so cunningly that the borderline between reality and fantasy is gradually eliminated. The first half hour is more of a straight gangster thriller as James Fox, who plays an enforcer for a London protection racket, goes about his work with such relish that he involves the gang in a murder and has to hide from retribution in a Notting Hill basement. There, waiting to escape abroad, he becomes involved with a fading pop star, played by Mick Jagger, brooding in exile over the loss of his powers of incantation. (laughs) In what might be described, to borrow from Kenneth Anger, As an invocation to his demon brother, the pop star recognizes his lost power lurking in the blind impulse to violence of his visitor and so teases and torments him with drug-induced psychedelics that the latter responds in only way he knows how by rewarding one mind-blowing with another at gunpoint. Uh, Ideas in profusion here about power and persuasion and performance... And the latter half becomes one of Rogue's most complex visual kaleidoscopes as pop star and enforcer coalesce in a marriage of heaven and hell or underworld and underground where the common denominator is big business. So there you go. Other than that last line, which is kind of uh, dorky, kind of goofy, (laughs) um, uh, that was not a bad write up. Right. uh, I liked. uh, Yeah, that wasn't bad. That was okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I liked I liked the use of the uh, the anger. Yes. um, Yes. And, Which, quote, and anger being one of the many Denzians of the crazy uh, 60s back then, crazy London in the yeah. 60s back then. Yeah, as we've mm-hmm. covered on the show before with our Lucifer Rising episode, Kenneth Anger, another right. big right. fixture of the scene here, which I'm sure we're getting into. But just Camel to kick being thing, in Lucifer Rising. That's right, mm-hmm. Donald Camel in Lu- Lucifer Rising, of course. Uh, but let's let's sort of kick it off. Uh, I was going to throw it to you, Marcus, because I know this movie made a profound effect on you at a certain point. Uh, yeah, right? <clears throat> I think I saw it early 
it's it's getting kind of blurry, but I think I saw it early college years. The the, the Stones weren't big in my house. Nobody like else liked the Rolling Stones. Hmm. It was kind of a Beatles household growing okay. up. So when I got into the Stones, it's all my own. You know, like my fault, my no parents holding my hand or anything. So it was a kind of a special place in my heart. I definitely found the uh, got into this movie from the soundtrack first Ooh. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think I've had a few copies of uh, over the years. Um, but no, it totally blew my blew my mind. The, the uh, <laughs> you know, first of all, the memo from Turner, which is like probably my favorite Stone song. That's not a Stone song, you know. Yeah. And then uh, I want to act the Coke convention back in 1965. And then the last poets when that track came on was oh. just like, what the fuck? Oh. Like it. The combo of those things. So I was like, I got to see this movie. And uh, I worked at a video store at the time. So I did not understand it at all. I was pretty bored during the first half. <laughs> till when I first saw this movie, and it was like, you know, 19 or something. And yeah. uh, till, till Mick came on. And then I was, you know, blown, I really enthralled, thoroughly confused for years. This movie still uh, perplexes me. Sure. Um, but uh, it's really, uh, it's mainly a, like a rock and roll movie. And it's not that often that like one of your favorite songs has a giant like section in a movie that's devoted just to that song. Some in fact, I wish there was more. Proto music video. Yeah. Absolutely. It absolutely. Is. I wish that, you know, wouldn't it be great if like uh, all your favorite songs had like a moment like this in a movie, you know? But, yeah. Uh, sure. Anyway, it was sort of the, the musical entrance for, was for me. And I had no idea who Rogue was or, you know, Camel or anybody connected to it at the time. It just seemed like this weird yeah. movie that Mick Jagger was in, you know? Yeah. Sure. I, I, for me, just personally, my connection to the movie, I got to shout out my, I was also working at a video store when I first discovered this movie. Uh, shout out to my former colleague, Mark Bowen, uh, who worked with Joey and I show out, uh, shout out Joey. to one fucking hour, Joey, um, uh, up at Amoeba music. He was a huge Donald Camel fanatic and he, um, turned me on to the Donald Camel BBC documentary, the um, Ultimate Performance, which Great is stuff. which is amazing. Um, because yeah. you know he's such a fascinating figure in cinematic history, very underrated, under discussed uh, person, undercredited person for a lot of the stuff that he did. Um, worked on just you know a handful of movies only, but they were all so <laughs> unique and wild and insane. Um, uh, hint, hint, white of the eye. Maybe someday we'll cover on the show. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's insane. It is. Yeah. Uh, um, Demon Seed. Demon Seed. Yeah. Just uh, Wild Side. Some amazing story stuff. By, on yep. the Touchables. He's like, this is like Story by Donald Camel. Oh, that movie, yeah, Touchables. Yeah, it leads, which, it's breadcrumbs towards uh, performance. That's right. right. That's but right. it's, I, I love that movie, though, even though it's not that good. But uh, it's also just awesome that he's connected to that. Totally. <laughs> Fascinating figure, fascinating life story, wild and crazy roller coaster life that this guy had. And uh, I was just enraptured by him, and my friend Mark turned me on to that. And I, of course, got this book, which, further reading for anybody, highly recommend this book as well, too. Um, the Very Donald cool. Campbell. Every, every bookshelf needs one of those. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really great. So, um, Anyway, yeah, um, and I, I just was like, it, this was coincided with performance coming out on DVD, which it was not available forever. Um, it was a yeah. long sought after big rare deal. film, and finally it came out on DVD from Warner Brothers. It was a big, big moment, and he was he was telling everybody about it and hooked me up with a copy hmm. again. Like Marcus had no idea what I just watched, but there were so <laughs> many cool, amazing moments in it and stylistic choices, which I'm sure we'll get into. But blew my mind. So, yeah, and I'm sure yeah. Tom, similar for you. Well, yeah, I didn't have a huge thing. It's just, uh, you know, uh, as I've said before, you know, I was really into cult movies, the cult movie books at the library when I was a kid, midnight movie books when I was a kid. Performance is mentioned, so that was like on my list in my head of like, oh, I should see this if I can. It was on like the movie channel at midnight yeah. once, you know, when <coughs> wow. I was a kid when I was like 12 or something. I stayed up all night and watched it. And at the very end, I just said to myself without even like thinking, I just automatically like a reflex just went like, that was a perfect movie. Which is not really the right thing to think because it's, yeah. I don't feel it is. <laughs> right. And it's, it, it, what I meant was it's more like that was a total experience. Right. Is I think what I was getting at when I just blurted that out. And so, and, and I still feel that way. It's just like it was such an exhilarating, pure cinematic experience. It was yeah. people making the most of this art, this uh, f um, f um, 
art form. Yeah. And 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 trying things and and just being playful and also being it's and then it makes it inherently so surprising. And it was just uh, an experience I'd never had before when I watched a film. Because, you know, a lot of the film, oh, this is experimental or whatever, and often it's so boring. The film is not boring. You know what I mean. Like, mm-hmm. guys, even when if, if it might have read as slow to you, you know, you. Um, and it's funny, uh, Mark, you should say that um, just to kind of lead into things. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that always stay with me in that great documentary, Ultimate Performance, is I've always loved this, is the dichotomy. Because the film is, you know, bifurcated. It's split in half yep. in a way. And a lot of those guys who were basically playing themselves uh, or, or adjacent, you know, like street guys, the gangster guys in the mm-hmm. first half uh, were commenting like, I don't bloody know what's going on in that second half. When <laughs> yeah. do, uh, it's, it's like, I don't care. I get bored. I turn it off. They're basically saying. But then it has Anita Pallenberg, you know, who's in the second half with Mick. She's like, I don't know. I couldn't make heads or tails of the first part with all those gangsters. <laughs> bored stiff. And it was just like, yeah. what? how many movies are like that? You yes. know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's like the pe- the participants in the film are like, I don't know what's going on. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'm bored. Next. And then it's like, but I'm riveted. It's like, what yeah. the fuck? You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So let's let's get into a little bit of the, of the Baby Got Back story uh, uh, with this movie to sort of set it up because there's a lot. It's, you know. It, it's the ultimate to me. And I'm, yeah. I'm already going to just uh, sure. apologize. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so basically um, the... From what I understand, Tom, you can chi- feel free to chime in. Is this sort of originated um, in in a couple different ways? But one of the main catalytic moments of this project was the studio wanted Donald Camel to develop sort of a hard day's night, uh, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, for the Rolling Stones. Right. <laughs> right? That was like the original. <laughs> yeah, this is like still. It's like the mid '60s. Yeah. Like I like meaning like studio execs didn't even have didn't even understand that you could have something as ugly and gnarly and fucked up as a performance. Like they, their, their, their imagination couldn't even imagine yeah. that a, people, anybody they'd invite to like make a, ro- a rock and roll movie, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Well, there was another, like, like this, the, the Dave Clark five had that movie. Uh, catch me. Was it catch me? You can, I think yeah, or whatever. Yeah, something John like Borman. Yeah, no, yeah. but what I'm saying is like, um, like what's wrong with inviting this guy who's a little artsy, who knows Mick Jagger, make a Rolling Stones movie like I'm just it, it always amuses me that they're like wait this could be a thing that we bankrolled you know and mm-hmm. that's what happened in a matter of months between like late 66 to like mid 68 yep. the nightmare starts like you know Strawberry Fields Forever is on the radio like yeah. it's, it, you know mm-hmm. dark yes. weird clouds for the straight world are, are coming you know mm-hmm. yeah and I also heard too that um, I believe an agent uh, at the Creative Management Associates at the time who liked Donald's writing um, also asked him, can you make a project? Because I think it was very hip at the time to sort of take two big giants from different worlds and sort of mash them together to make sort of a cinematic event. And I guess the idea was, can you make a movie combining Marlon Brando and Mick Jagger in a movie yeah. as well, too? So I think right. that was also right. part of the the the, the ask. Right. Yeah. Campbell befriended Brando and, and they had a friendship that lasted till, uh, you know, their deaths or, you know, yeah. Campbell's death first, you know, and they were going to work on a project in the 90s. Like uh, they had real simpatico, which is very cool, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, the other thing is, um, weirdly, Campbell was in a, a writing partnership with his, with his brother, actually. Mm-hmm. And they worked on two films that I'd recommend just as breadcrumbs towards performance. Yeah. If you haven't heard of them, seen them. There's Duffy, which is 1968, which includes uh, James Fox. Yep, and that's the friendship there starts yeah. uh, to lead towards performance. It's not very good, but you see hints of things, and it is like a mainstream film. It's like both feet are kind of in the mainstream, you know, like James Coburn's the lead, mm. but it's kind of fucked up and kind of like uh, mm-hmm. distracted and stoned. And then uh, you know, is uh, the Touchables, which they both wrote, and it was mm-hmm. actually the Touchables was written. Sorry, the Touchables was directed by the Beatles photographer. Uh, what's his name like uh, Robert Friedman. Friedman Robert Friedman crazy which is such a cool thing it's not much of a film but it, it's pretty it's eye candy visually it's, really cool. it's incredible and, you know exactly but, and, it, yeah. and, and, it, and it lends itself to having you imagine that you could get wind up in a performance thing and it's all that mm. kind of swinging London atmosphere mm-hmm. and, and I've said to myself like this film was not made by any of these people but it was made by uh, swinging London Mm-hmm. By, by, the, 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 by the the vortex that was created by this confluence of all these incredibly weird, interesting, talented people. Yoko, mm-hmm. Beatles, 
Kenneth Anger went out there, you know, sure. Stones, and everyone is all on LSD <laughs> or even more STP, the, the drug that's even <laughs> for the people who are bored by LSD. So that's what it is. It's this incredible group of people all meeting up mm -hmm. and on hard drugs for a yeah. few years and you get performance. And combining ideas and sharing concepts and different uh, mysticisms and <laughs> philosophies and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I yep. guess Donald had <clears throat> developed a separate project around this time because this movie, yeah, being sort of early developed in the mid 60s, doesn't get filming, doesn't start till 68, right? Or 68, right? 68, yeah. And the movie doesn't come out till 70, which we'll get into. But yeah. um, around this time before, you know, uh, the project would become performance, he had a, uh, he had developed a, a script called, uh, or uh, maybe an outline for a, pr a project called The Liars. Which was a oh sorry it was it was a treatment about a gangster on the run who by chance meets a pop star in London and the idea was to juxtapose the worlds of criminality and art and uh, the author of this Donald Camel book uh, the uh, uh, Life on the Wild Side um, noted that that would be a theme that Donald Camel would explore in all of his a lot of his other movies like uh, we, you know we we're talking about. Um, uh, we were talking about the film Wide of the Eye. It's about a serial killer who creates these artistic scenes through his killings and things. So it's something that he would return to as sort of a yeah. uh, theme. Uh, and and in again. a way, even his own death, his suicide, <sighs> was a work of art, honestly. you know, It's one of the craziest things. Uh, I guess while we're here, we should just touch on it because it's very chilling. But yeah, Donald Camel took his own life in 1996. He shot himself in the head in his Hollywood Hills home. Uh, and it took him 45 minutes to pass away. And during that time, he had a conversation with his wife, which he talked about performance <laughs> and how, you know, Mick, Mick Jagger's character being shot in the head uh, as, an, as a form of assisted suicide. So very uh, dark, fuck? fucking crazy poetic uh, thing. But he was suffering from chronic, severe chronic depression. And uh, the studio was recutting his film he was working on at that time, Wildside, without his permission. And so that's what a lot of people felt was the catalytic event there. So wow. crazy that, that both those that's worlds crazy. collide. Yeah, 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 for sure. So anyway, let's get into the movie. Uh, anything else you want to touch on in terms of the pre-pro before we get into the pro? Pre-production? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I, it's, I think this is one of those simple cases where you know, studios were beginning to scramble that you know, people weren't necessarily just wanting to see the sound of music, you know, yeah. was, all this stuff is happening, all these pop groups, rock and roll, mm -hmm. and they were kind of trying to like figure this out. And you know, the, the studios, big corporations like Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they just heard Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. He hasn't been in a movie. Let's be the first place that gets this guy who might be a, a, a movie star as much as a rock star. Um, and, and yes, Hard Day's Nine and Help set the precedent for studios to think, oh, this is a bankable thing. You know? Sure. So simply stated, I've always felt, it's obvious, that um, if Mick Jagger, specifically Mick Jagger, wasn't involved, uh, this wouldn't have gotten made. No. And then also it helped it get finally released because it was a real struggle two years later to get this film actually out. And it was all simply because of the star value of Mick Jagger. Mm -hmm. So that really... That was everything, you know. If if it was like if it was starring like Steve Winwood of Traffic, you know, forget it. You know, James Taylor, <laughs> or like <clears throat> Jack Bruce, and Ginger Baker. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Ginger so Baker, I I would see the Ginger Baker. Version okay, Ginger of, Baker uh, performance. Yeah, of this. But you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah it's, but it's cool ahead. that it's made too by people that were the insiders on the scene too, and not just like somebody coming sure. from the outside. You know, there are other yeah. films or someone from the outsides making like a Swinging London, like you know, a film that doesn't quite capture the essence of it. But just to elaborate, like all the people that were in it, like well, you know, like um. Is it like Robert Fraser and like his gallery sort of are tangential to this as well, mm -hmm. right? Like he the, uh, introduced Indica Anita gallery. Pallenberg and yeah, with uh, introduced gallery. Anita to uh, Brian Jones or whatever. So it's John like a lot Yoko of, there. Right. That's right. Yeah. So there's a lot of like, uh, you know, that scenesterism. And, and well, and, and to the point, Donald Camel would be at an, an, an opening at Indigo Gallery right next to Mick mm -hmm. Jagger. You know, and it was all, you're right, it was all, they were all steeped together mm -hmm. and included Kenneth Anger. And I was just going to say, like, yeah, shout out to Kenneth Anger. Well, total was... side note is um, that uh, Camel has an interesting lineage. His father was the biographer 
or a biographer of uh, Aleister Crowley. Yeah, that's, uh, that's and they weird. lived uh, near near his estate. So that's always been an element for him. And so, uh, and then the intersection of anger and yep. Crowley and all that kind of stuff. And uh, everyone's on LSD, yep. like getting mm-hmm. spooked out, you know. Totally. So, uh, we had that great picture of like Donald Campbell and Kenneth Anger in our uh, Loose for Rising episode. There's that picture of them together. Like, I think Anger like, lived in, he was, he was part of, he was in that scene before a few months, like in the 60s or something. Sure. Yeah, he was right. hanging out there. Well, he, and, was and, trying and, to, and, he, he was trying to make a move to get the Rolling Stones involved in he, some well, film project. He, he worked well, with you know, Mick, Mick in Loose for Rising. Yeah. You know, in Invocation right. of My Demon exactly. Brother. Mick Jagger does well, the soundtrack. He got Mick to do the score for yeah. it. But yeah, he, they weren't right. like yeah. He was trying to get Lucifer Rising to be kind of more Rolling Stonesy and like yeah, maybe yeah, Mick yeah, yeah. would be the lead guy. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it would be Lucifer. Right, exactly. So that was because that was project was started in like the late sixties. You know, when he, right. He One left uh, San Francisco because Bobby Beausoleil mm-hmm. burned him, man, and it yeah. got too dark in California, <laughs> and so he came to the swing in London. I love but it. But anyway, there's something like that. Well, just is a couple other little things. It's like. Um, uh, Keith Richards is going out with Anita Pallenberg, who's yep. a real firecracker, a real yep. wildcat person on this scene too. Uh, you know, and she'd been in uh, the film Candy and Barbarella, and uh, she's from all indications she seems like a really a woman who could go toe to toe with these freaks. You know, and like I think uh, they, she really bonded with like Kenneth Anger, for instance. You know, so and she wait is she, oh no no Marion Faithful Marion Faithful too because I think yep. she's in Lucifer Rising. So she is. Uh, but anyway, uh, Pall- uh, Pallenberg wound up being in cast in um, the film, and uh, just one little moment to give you an indication of how in- just sort of generally insane the shoot was. Keith Richards would hang out outside the set <laughs> and see what Anita's up to because he <laughs> feared that Mick and her would start boning because they were in the film supposed to be hooking up. Yeah. You know, so he, well, he stole jealous. her from Brian Jones too, right? So there was already yeah, like a little yeah, bit of a history there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Fair and enough. there's and also he, and, yeah, and Brian Jones died like right around that time, you know. So yeah. um there's also uh, and, a lot of rumor yeah, though. There's a lot of there was a lot of rumor and innuendo, if you will, uh, uh about what was going on at that time and that the Rolling Stones were gonna have more of a role in the music in this movie. But it's sort of uh, the rumors were because Keith also from what this book says, the Donald Camel book is that Keith Richards hated Donald Camel had wanted nothing to do with him. And it was partly because of that and the jealousy to, uh, with mm-hmm. Mick and his and his yeah. girlfriend that led this to yeah. not have as much direct involvement. I, I'd heard film. that, too. And uh, and we'll get to the soundtrack because that to me is like a third of what's amazing about this film. But mm-hmm. just Marcus, what you were saying is like uh, Memo from Turner. So great. It's kind of a Rolling Stone song. It's not a Rolling Stone song, but that's not Keith. For whatever reason, Keith did do a track. But, but they dumped it for some reason right. going on. And then there's just a guy who's doing like a, a wannabe Keith. <laughs> mimicry of Keith. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the guy on the memo from Turner is it's Ry Cooter. You know, he's playing the slide oh, guitar yeah. in that. But there's another just, guy. Anyway, that, there's another that's guy. That's what's really bitching. I mean, like, his, he's coming off of like Safest Milk and stuff where he was like playing yeah. the kind of innovative Ry blues thing. 60s guy. Ry Cooter is really cool before like the, you know, Buena Vista, Joy Luck Club, or whatever stuff. Yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, But like, uh, I think '60s Ry Cooter was really dope. Um, totally, especially uh, mainly because <clears throat> the song, I guess. His Let's definitely carve good. out some uh, soundtrack I... time. Very special, but just yeah. wanted to say, like, the Keith stuff is yeah. an indicator of like the, like the weird. There's like ba- as much good vibes as bad vibes for the yeah. '60s mm-hmm. involved in the film. <clears throat> Can I just throw one thing about Pallenberg out just while we're on the subject? <clears throat> so um, Anita Pallenberg uh, is the one uh, who brought to the script the ideas um, and the inspiration uh, from the you know th- sort of theatrical um, absurdist guy um, Antonian um, Atra. How do you say his name? Atra. Uh, 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 Arto. Arto. Yeah. Antonin Arto. Yeah. yeah. So she brought the Arto influence directly to the project, which is very interesting um, because this that. movie does get into um, you know a lot of the transcendence of the self and you know, the destruction of that. And, uh, you know, um, um, you know, this guy's performance art was, you know, pure madness and destruction and yeah. craziness. In like the twenties. Yeah. yeah. He did, uh, the, <laughs> his theory was the theater of cruelty theater. Right. And if you were to like uh, read about it, it would look like 1987 butthole surfers, like <laughs> literally, you know what I mean? Uh, like, like, you know, like disorienting, yeah. like flashing lights, room filled with smoke yeah atonal noises from all directions naked people wandering around and uh yeah or, so or you pr- could say that that would be uh you know Arto influenced 
we talked about this before, uh, El Topo's Odorowski yep. and his mm-hmm. mid sixties, um, uh, happening freakouts are yeah. very Anthony Narto. Yeah. So he was a hot, a tight, he was a hot name yep. in the sixties. Glad you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really interesting that she, she brought it to the project and, uh, would sort of fight to get that credit, uh, over the years, uh, as, as she deserves that, credit and she's from yeah. all indications. I've read Rolling Stones biographies. Like she didn't produce a thing, which isn't necessarily anybody's faltering like that. But I think she, if she had, uh, it would have been very cool. Like if she had made a film yeah. or her yeah. own album or something. She yeah. seems like she's a was a very fascinating person. Totally. Who guys weren't just turned on by her, but they found her like literally bewitching and mm-hmm. a, a very exciting person, like yeah. male or female, whatever. Uh, of that scene it's just she hadn't happened to have made a thing that you know all these other guys did and that Mm -hmm. and that's a theme that carries over sort of into the directors themselves we should just address this before we get into the movie itself um because over the years the issue of who really directed performance or who had you know more to do with x y and z has been one of those persistent kind of chicken or the egg sort of questions um, and many critics and historians tend to always favor Nick Rogue as the person who's more of the creative behind this movie, mainly because, you know, Donald's career was very elusive after this movie. And Nick obviously went on to create, you know, Don't Look Now, which we've covered on the show before, Walk About, you know, all these big more huge, famed. Yeah. Uh, art house uh, and, career and, and florid. Uh, you know, yeah. he had a real filmography, and so you know, and then you, and then you kind of just go like, and then there's this other guy, Campbell. Like, what? What? Yeah. And so I get that, but once the minute you like really start unpacking who Campbell was as a person, he's kind of like I'm saying with uh, with Anita Pallenberg, like you know, the volume of their work isn't high, you know, or hers is none. But like, I think that they were engaging people, and Campbell was certainly one of those. He bewitched people, mm-hmm. and uh, and that I think that I think as much as Mick Jagger being you know the star. Uh, I think him just being so interesting and having so much like really weird, heavy energy got this film to cross the finish line because mm-hmm. he was so full of fi- interesting ideas. So to speak to that, I've, from everything I've understood, Rogue and Camel together in their own way have always said it's 50-50, uh, which is very unique with you know co-directed films, which is a rarity in the mm-hmm. first place. And I think that you can't break it down by how some people say that uh, you know Coppola worked with the actors and uh, was it Gordon Willis? Mm-hmm. You know, did the, the visual, DP, the, the, the mm-hmm. look of the film, the filmmaking, uh, like that is a little bit of a thing about The Godfather. But this is not the case here because I used to think that it would be like, well, Campbell's talking with the actors, and then Rogue, because he's Rogue, is like, ooh, the shot, and like, what are we mm-hmm. going to do next? And this is how we'll cut this part. No, it was very even, and everything I uh, I've read again is just like there's such a blur. Even for them, it's just they got simpatico and they yeah. got they got lined up. And they just moved forward together as one entity, which is mm-hmm. really fascinating because there's two very powerful, interesting people, you know? Yeah, totally. And um, <clears throat> also, I know that Donald Camel, too, brought a lot of uh, interesting influences uh, from other films into this movie as well, mm-hmm. uh, m- many of which people would associate more with Nick Rogue because he went on to be... You know, Nick Rogue went on to be known for his sort of nonlinear editing and the, mm-hmm. you know, all of the sort of avant-garde tricks he would bring to these movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. But can you guys name the three big movies that inspired uh, this movie? Camel. No, there's one that you might not be mentioning. I want to bring up the uh, kind of cool thing. But what? But yeah. Okay. Godard? Here's the three. Here's the three that at least were represented in this in this book uh, that I'm keep referencing. One is the obvious, which was a huge part of last week's or last episode's uh, a film, of course, Persona. Another film, sort of about the, you know, the taking of identity, the melding yeah, of identity, the vampirism of that. Of course, was it made a huge impression on Donald Camel. The other film, uh, which I'd love to do a one fucking hour on, uh, stars um, James Fox, of course, who's in this movie, is uh, The Servant. Uh, right. the, a very similar power dynamic, if you will, yeah. <laughs> that happens between Mick and James sure. Fox's character in this movie. But what's the movie <clears throat> that stylistically blew his mind that that really influenced this movie? Uh, can you name it? It's a movie we've covered on this fine program once well, before. Well, I Gosh, actually, yeah. I think I know where you're going with this, and I, I was reading about that. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, point blank. Point blank. That's right. Uh, yeah. Shout out yeah. in the archives. Not surprising. Once you know that, it's yes. just like 
But yeah, it's like cool. hell. Make a double feature with both films. Oh, you know? it's and you can mm. see it too. I mean, yeah. you. W- one thing we talked about yeah. when we when we did Point Blank is you know you have that homoeroticism of the male leads. You have mm-hmm. the that editing style, like the 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 crazy, just you know weird cuts interjecting in, flash forwarding to moments that the other characters are referencing. <clears throat> and one moment that I love to talk about, maybe my favorite scene in the whole first half is uh-huh. that that amazing fight scene uh, when it's just the red paint being splashed on the oh, walls mm-hmm. and the feathers. That's very point blank to do. That's a point it blank is. move, you know? And, and uh, just the bullet leading to like psychedelic experience or whatever, you know, like that sort of uh, thematic sure. connection as well. Totally. Uh, cool. But that first part you're saying that like, you know, I think one thing we might want to think about here is the word violence. And I only say this because uh, repeatedly Camel brings it up. He's saying this is not a violent film, but it's a film about violence. Right. And it's sort of beyond like the dichotomy of like um, peace and love and make love, not war. It was more like um, like the power of violence. And he found uh, there's an obvious power of violence in the gangsters and their kind of sex appeal you know, uh, uh, of the gangster, uh, you know, uh, in, in this film and another gangster film, but then also the sexy power and the general power and the possibly raw, violent power of rock yeah. and roll that mm-hmm. a little later just became the Stooges, for instance, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, the Stones were pretty heavy for the time, but then rock and roll has, has had a violent trip for a long time. Some could say almost from the beginning, right. there were riots. There's a Doors poster in this movie, yes. you know, on the wall. You yeah. know? Dor- John, uh, Jim Morrison's is bad news, you know, yeah. like, and, you know exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, anyway, I'm just saying that like um, this film, uh, you know, like there's the, the, the connective tissue, what you might, which you might not see initially, which is, you know, like clean cut gangster types who like, you know, look um, part of the part of the normal world and then like a freaky long haired, you know, you know, androgynous looking like rock star guy. They both have overlapping sort of um, interests in pay- playing the game of the power of violence. Yeah. And then they, they intersect and they come together, you know, inside this and, film. And, and so. Right. And and what, on that tip, too, just real quick about what to tie it back to point blank is I think Donald was very specifically influenced by and we talked about this in the episode is how, you know, one theory about point blank is that, <clears throat> you know, he is a ghost sort of living out mm-hmm. a fantasy of revenge and it's taking something that script by any other director or, or that movie would have been very conventional kind of boring, you know, g- gangster film of the 60s. But the idea of sort of elevating and finding these very trippy ideas of like Gnosticism and, you know, whatever within this material of, you know, gangsters yeah. and stuff. And I think he yeah. was very inspired by the, what, what you could do with the world of gangsters, you know, that underworld well, and sort of elevating uh, it in this context. And I, I'm just, you know, I don't break the piggy bank here on my Godard references, but sure. he was doing, I mean, Breathless is just immeasurably influential. There's like a totally. shadow of Breathless for the whole 10 years. Sure. Uh, and Breathless is, on the face of it, just like some dumb guy who shot a cop and is, mm-hmm. you know, on the lam from the cops. And, like, then there's the gal, and then the gal sells him out, and, like, you know, and it's all sexy, and it's all, you know, like a garbage schlock pulp fiction, mm-hmm. you know, paperback yeah. kind of thing. But so often, you know, uh, kind of starting with uh, Godard and the French New Wave, is is looking under the hood at these sort of, like, you know, forsaken genre kind of tropes and this is another film that does that and point blank was first not mm-hmm. first but it was it was mm-hmm. i'm sorry it was early yeah. post Godard. um but uh, this film takes it even further yeah and it's interesting to see the journey of the gangster film mm-hmm. uh because like i said before you know half of the film isn't a gangster film uh <laughs> you know yeah but the 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 echoes and the shadow of the gangster film you see first does influence and, and and there's the foreboding of it all and you also know like you know Chaz is in trouble i mean you, you know he and he's not forgetting it and you're not forgetting it yeah mm-hmm. and of course that's how he meets his end this is a gangster ending but then the cap on it is mick jagger in a blonde wig in a limo you know what mm-hmm. i mean yeah. <laughs> uh, supposedly camel was like living in uh paris at the time too right or like around the time like in the early 60s so yeah he actually knew like a lot of the French knew it, Godard, and like, oh, had, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, conversation with them. So it was more than just being a fan, but like being like really steeped in that world, too. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah, let's, it's funny. He, uh, just real quick, just Camel is so interesting. Like, there's one thing that really made me stop and think about the power of his personality is do you remember this Barbara Steele 
when she wasn't famous and she was just this beautiful girl on the street, he he came up to her and he's not like a great looking guy. And he was kind of like short, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't like, he didn't have the physicality of like an imposingly, you know, like virulent sexual, uh, you know, kind of like sick mag, mag, you know, magnet, you know, but she found him so alluring and she like kind of fell in love with him right there on the street because he was just running this whole trip and he was yeah he had this magnetism of his own that was singular and i and i kind of stayed with me yeah. so mm. like he he really he was uh he got around is what i'm saying so um uh i think there's something there's a power to him that i that is underdeveloped i wish he made more films but at least he mm -hmm. made this one and then a, the other little do -do -do's, you know yeah <laughs> Well, let's 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 just talk and start talking, getting into some set pieces with the movie, and 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 talk about the editing too, because the editing is <clears throat> very very amazing in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing with regards to the editing that hits you right off the top is that incredible sex montage, sex scene montage, off the top. You know, this like rough Jets. BDSM jazz, <laughs> you know, uh, sex scene that uh, and, uh, feels so ahead this? of its time. You guys will like this. How many movies have the word poop in like red paint on a white wall that looks like blood? It Not says, enough. It says poop. I thought it was poo. It was just, is it, it's poop? I'm seeing a P O O P. So anyway, all I'm saying is there's 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 it's such a na it's it really is a stunning opening of a film. It's immediately disorienting, and we will again drill down on the editing. Mm -hmm. journey this film took there's like four editors and four <laughs> periods of editing and we'll get into that in a second but just you're so right when that film starts it starts with like an uh, it's everything's very harsh and ugly and mm -hmm. so un Woodstock honestly yeah it's yeah, like yeah. a film starting with the 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 abrasive ungroovy sound of like like the jet fuel blasting engines <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah that's yeah. the first like note struck it's mm -hmm. great and then yes a harsh bad s m violence yes mm -hmm. just like boys and girls and there's the gay thing is off, you know off the charts you know it the feels like that, yeah it know? feels like you're mm -hmm. watching uh male like, buttocks like, yeah it feels like I, I don't know it feels like you're watching like a al adamson movie or like a, i don't know or like some <laughs> but or kind of thing yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 but it's like you know what the pa and again well we're talking about the editing we're talking about the movie yeah the, the you know uh <laughs> kenneth anger's pacing in scorpio rising is pretty groovy but he often has a pretty glacial pace relative to the very rock and roll pace of the editing especially in a, in a scene like the opening uh mm -hmm. montage you're talking about yeah and can, can we maybe get into like sort of the journey of the editing sure i mean go does does that make sense if we're talking as yeah. we go through the film a bit yeah okay so uh frank mazzola mm -hmm. interesting guy i had lunch with him once mm. he is the second and primary editor of the film mm -hmm. i talked with him uh i was with joy great guy he's no longer with us mm. but he was weirdly a jazz drummer in the 50s and he's Whoa. one of that generation that's like he was older in the 60s but he's part of the cool crew like that dennis hoppery kind of early mid 60s la like um bohemia sure. and uh but he really was a jazz drummer and he for some reason got into editing and he was telling me he said film editing is a is a vis has a visual meter and he greatly valued and the drumming in his head so when he would edit he would be thinking it's like wow drum playing drum solos hit the bongos here snare like like crash and it's like that's the kind of guy you've got behind the wheel in the editing bay which is amazing <laughs> but he also completely bonded immediately with um uh, it was one of the great creative uh connections that camel had and they worked together through all the projects until uh camel's death you know oh they wow. they, 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 they they still work together all the way through everything and anyway he said that um you know, when they got the film, he immediately loved it. He was like, this is great. And no one loved it. There was an initial editor who was a real stiff, didn't want to even do it. It was just, he wanted to bring it down and to be a conventional story. And then he, so what I'm saying is he got Camel, he got the film. Side note, Rogue had to leave and start Walkabout. So this film got like very more crazy. There's the shoot and the story yeah. and <laughs> yeah. how it was shot. But then it got much more crazy in the editing with Frank Mazzola at the helm working with Cam and Camel's right there. Camel would be like right behind him and he'd, he'd be reading and he'd start reading like um, a James Joyce short story and he's like <laughs> reading lines and then Frank Mazzola's like, oh, totally, man. And like, <laughs> stone, <laughs> like editing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what's happened for like six months. <laughs> but what I'm saying is Rogue, you got to remember Rogue left. He's gone. He's in Australia. Wow. With the amazing walkabout. 
he didn't like these edits. He thought it went way too far. And so did Mick Jagger. They went like, what have you done to this movie? The story is mm -hmm. destroyed. And I think part of it was they were running on this rhythm that they heard internally that was wow. like rock and roll, like an album. And wow. if you think about it that way, you can really feel that like it's like a rock and roll edited movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's mm -hmm. what they were shooting for. Also, they had just the last thing, and this is my little editing Frank Mazzola thing, and I'll shut up. But they had a practical concern. I'm almost done. No, they no, had it's, a practical it's, concern. It's, it's good. Here we go. Uh, the studio said, get Mick in the movie earlier. Yes. So they said, okay, so they were collapsing the first gangster part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and by necessity to get to Mick, and they cut to Mick sometimes as a, a you know, like a foreshadowing during gangster part, these spray painting stuff. So. Yep. They found it's the kind of movie where like they was like finding B-roll and it wasn't intended. It's not part of the movie. And yeah. Like, yeah, put it in in like the first three minutes. So they had to condense it and they started having fun with it. And uh, the story was collapsing and it was becoming don't ever have anyone knock on the door, open the door. Don't have anyone walk out of the car mm -hmm. and nothing just like pop, 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 urgent, essential mm -hmm. action. So <laughs> that's it. Yeah. My big shout out to Frank Mazzola. Yeah, that's cool. Really interesting guy. And this was made with, in a way, it's made. It has three filmmakers. Yeah, There's that's Camel cool. Mazzola, Camel Rogue. Yeah, you know, so cool. Love that. A yeah. lot of the, a lot of the editing too. I think is helped. Well, just the filmmaking in general helped too by the awesome like synthesizer soundtrack work oh. done by Mick too. You know, I mean, like the fact that you got Mick in the movie and doing the soundtrack. Well, he, didn't, and, he didn't do the he didn't do the mug though. He, well, are you sure? No, it's Frank uh, uh, um, Krause, there's, this guy Krause. Okay, well, there's an entire fake documentary from the 60s that shows him using the Moog, on, like creating the music for the soundtrack. Yeah. Then, I it's mean, you're a, saying that's not Be real, but like... Beaver and Krause is this... Okay, doing. well, I know Beaver and Krause is, but they're not like... Okay, well, there's a, yeah, there's a soundtrack. Uh, there's like a little documentary featurette from the 60s that's like Mick Jagger, the Moog synthesizer, well, developed by Moog, you know. And it, they were so, fudging you're saying that's all bullshit? Yeah, they're fudging the truth, you know. Oh, okay. Because wow. it was cooler sounding than like two unknown, boring looking guys. Right, right. The <laughs> but Come the uh, the the uh, there's there's some fucking needle drops of that <clears throat> when it's it, it sounds like maniac. It really does sound like. Do you remember Mick? Remember? Oh, like uh, maniac. Is it soundtrack time. We only have twenty more minutes. I mean, you guys. I was Go. It was running me of like a, you know, I was thinking about Doctor Who and stuff like that that was going on on TV at the time. You know what I mean? Because at first I was like, you know, there's like a, a gunshot and like a, a synth pad that's like, wow, at the very beginning. And I was like, I was like, holy shit, is that the first time that's in a movie? And then I was thinking like, actually, that was probably happening like on Doctor Who episodes and stuff in the mid 60s. In maybe they had that whole like BBC radiophonic <laughs> workshop the, type thing. Delia Devonshire. Yeah. But, well, so, 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 the, uh, so like, so, well, okay. I want to say one thing is an overarching thing that I think is a good theme for this whole episode is Camel did not like the auteur theory. Yeah. And yeah. he liked the idea of having a film be made by a collective of people. So it's time to start shouting out some of the principal people involved in the soundtrack. And really the big thing here is, is uh, Jack Nietzsche. Okay. Right. Now Camel befriended him, I think through the, through the stones, through the stones. And so they gave him a, an edited performance and he just went up to his, like, he called it like the witch castle or whatever uh, out in the Laurel Canyon. <laughs> and he would just watch the movie on 16, I guess, Stone and he would just compose it. So he's the he's the brainchild of the soundtrack. And he brought wow. in uh, Beaver Krause, who were big early Moog innovators. And um, The Last Poets was recommended actually by Anita Pallenberg, another Amazing. example of how, That's of cool. how fucking cool she <laughs> was, right? She was like, oh, you got to get The Last Poets in there. Right? <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. But really, it's it's Jack uh, Nietzsche's work, um, and who also worked with Robert Downey, by the way. They had an album. You should look that up. <laughs> but dude, but, uh, Last Jack Poets, Nietzsche, uh, let's not move yeah. past that, because that is oh, last that's such okay, a sure. fresh... I mean, that's such a I've fresh. Said, when that drops, it's like yeah. it's 1970. You're the coolest thing in the world yeah. when you've got a Warner Brothers film and you're letting the last poets ride, <laughs> and there's everyone sulking and they're on mushrooms. Like, does not get cooler. Somewhere in the atmosphere, far away from here, beyond realms of white dimensions. 
Yeah, I know that is the <laughs> that was a studio fucking movie, you guys. Like, Does not get cooler. This Does is a time. No. Shit was shit was different back then, man. Fuck. Yeah, but but the yeah. soundtrack. So <clears throat> another thing, the one that's spellbinding to me, and I listen to the soundtrack like all the time. Mm-hmm. It, well, first of all, Randy Newman uh, does a great job. He's involved in it. Yeah, um, yeah. Before he became corny, Randy Newman. He's a pretty interesting guy, <laughs> and he was friends with Jack Nietzsche. No, they had a great saying, lo- "Long Gone Train." L- uh, yeah. Long Dead Train, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, great mm-hmm. song by him. He plays, but then I think really, he plays on uh, Turner too, actually. Right, right. But the MVP for me is the is the use of Mary Clayton, who's famous for the the female vocal part of "Give Me oh. Shelter." Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. Uh, you know, yes. like uh, yes. Ray Murder, you know, yeah. and she's all over this soundtrack and it's spellbinding. Like yeah. her voice is so powerful and so amazing. Yeah. And, and, and it shivers and, uh, up your spine. And it's, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, like Mark is saying, like huge, weird, discordant Moog, and then her singing, and then a rock band comes smashing in, and just, and then just pulsating, ugly, harsh, kind of like maniac slasher movie it is style, maniac. pulsating, <coughs> yeah. like Moogs, like it's gong, the gong, maniac, gong, gong, gong. Mm-hmm. like yeah. what the fuck, right. dude? And it's 1970. <laughs> and then like um, Roots slide guitar too, you know, like yeah. very like rustic, rootsy sounding stuff. <laughs> Oh, it's like earthy, you, not like the kind of like fake blues of like yeah, mid sixties London. No, I know you know? What you mean. Yeah, it's it's just so I, I hate to use the word, but it's so hip. It is because everything else was like navel gazing, granola munching, kind of like uh, <laughs> Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and yeah. this was just like kong, 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 kong. <laughs> yeah, last poets and like wow, you know, and it's like. Doesn't get hipper. I'm going to say that again. So the soundtrack is highly recommended, and it does propel the film, and they're perfectly matched. And and it would be the film wouldn't be as good by the, by half if the soundtrack yeah. was something else. That's true. It's, it's, it's true. And, and if you just listen to the soundtrack, you're kind of watching the movie. It's mm-hmm. it's that evocative. It's yeah, really really incredible. And so Jack Nietzsche is to be um, lauded for that side of this anti auteur film. Where there's all these uh, confluence of great creatives everywhere, you know. Well, let's let's well with with the 15 minutes almost, we're we're about 60 minutes uh, from from end here. Let's just talk, let's just spend a little bit of time talking about the second half. Uh, you know, fucking amazing, uh, of course, and just like you know, like the the setting, the costume design, very Kenneth, a- or sorry, very Alistair Crowley ish, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of what's going on there. Um, you know, of course, all the pop art on the walls, the collage of like posters, you know, mm-hmm. the Peter Blake posters, mm-hmm. you know, the, um, the Mick Jagger they, kind of faces. Oh, it's uh, I think it's mm-hmm. guy Pilart. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. That's yeah. That's the motorcycle yeah. guy. Yeah. 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 Pilart, yeah, yeah. Um, no, what I, but the thing is what makes this movie so great is that yes, like it's a kind of film where there's great background, you know, like murals and stuff like that. But this is the kind of film that punch cuts, punk rock cuts <laughs> to like, like a close up of like the pop art paintings mouth, like, yeah. like yeah. randomly yeah. comes and goes. <laughs> Very Godard influenced, but I got to say, this movie has more energy than Godard. This is sort of like a Godard film, really informed by rock and roll, and and not so much, you know, like confrontational, Gangster, you know, like uh, like, like film. Marleyism, mm-hmm. uh, because you know Godard worked with uh, the Rolling Stones. And to speak earlier to what we were <laughs> yeah. saying about like somebody was saying, I think Marcus was like they wanted to like have people like glom together, like what if we got done yeah. and done all these iconic yeah. people, and that was Godard and Stones with the film uh, One Plus One. Yeah, and so that this is born of, in that same kind of attitude that the Godard Stones film came from. The Stones yeah. got lucky; they have so many films. You know, like I wish. I mean, I love them all, but I wish they had spread it around like a few more. You know, like a couple other bands had gotten some of them. There's so many. You know, Give Me Shelter yeah. and Yeah, Sympathy for the Devil, Sucker yeah. Blues, and Shelter, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, no, hundred um, percent. But yeah, it just it's just so wild, and of course, like the whole mushroom trip, like the depiction of the mushroom sort of uh experience is incredible in this movie <laughs> the first time you see chaz with the wig <laughs> you know sort of Dude. descending into you know becoming mick is yeah. incredible 
And yeah. it's not like let's all drop acid and free love, and it's like they're like torturing him almost, or yes, something, you yeah. know, by dosing him without know. his knowledge. <laughs> it's all so sour. Hey, quick shout out actually to um, James Fox. Now I remember my mom knew this, and she told me before I saw a performance. She was like, "Yeah, poor James Fox. Like he's in that movie uh, performance." You know, mm. I was like, "What happened?" And and she told me, and it always chilled me, and it, it, it added like a little darker, even darker dimension to this film. But he shot the film. And he literally lost his mind. And he was a big actor. He was in The Servant. Huh. He was in mainstream films. He was a very... He was in Thoroughly Modern Millie. Yeah, Shout out yeah, to yeah. A three, our three women episode. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. Right. Whoa. Yeah. But like, like he was uh, more than up and coming. He was like a major you know, yeah. British actor. And he did this film and he really bought the farm. He lost it. And this wow. film changed his life. Now he joined, some call it a cult, but it was more like this like aggressive... You know, like take over your life kind of organization of um, self a self help group. Okay, and he he didn't come up from that till like the late eighties. <laughs> so I mean, this just shows you that this film was incredibly consequential to the second lead of the film, Charles, uh, James Fox. He was he fucking lost it. Wow, you know, he was wow. out, and he'll say that he's like, yes, my life changed. Uh, for maybe not good, maybe not bad, but I was not the same person well, after I made seems, this film. How many times? How, when can you say that? Yeah. You know? Well, it seems it seems as though a lot of what was happening on screen, there was a lot of reality uh, to that. Yes. You know, we're probably yes. seeing half the film is probably a documentary. <laughs> you know, that yes, we're totally. seeing. Well, I think you know? they are. I think they are uh, making like really. Yeah, kind of messing around naked. Yeah, sure. Because uh, I've seen an edit on fil- like a, a theater screening uh, where there's like more nudity and it's more like graphic and like they're like really hooking up her Mick and Anita Ballenberg and the yeah. the other girl mm-hmm. um, Mary Barton or whatever. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's like and the drugs. Act. It's Who not. Knows? It's they're they're filming a happening of people making out. You know, right? Yeah, and, and drugs, the mobster shit in the movie too where it's like the yep. uh, the mobsters that they yep. use you know there was like a lot of uh the guy david Lit- litvinoff is like really actually like involved yep. in crime and stuff they're all and, amateurs uh, none of those guys yeah. are actors they're all from the street you know yeah the guy who plays harry flowers is that's the mm-hmm. the right the mob boss yeah. yeah yeah one thing that's cool too about this uh uh just my own personal you know shout out here in the in the gangster scene gotta shout it out um when they're in the, uh, I think they're they're at the bar. There's a quick shot to like one of the straight gangster dudes reading a Doctor Strange comic book. Did you spot that? <laughs> yeah. Sure. And 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 that's also was. I mean, if you if you go back and 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 look at Doctor Strange from you know 1967, you know, and before 64 even, uh-huh. like I mean, that's proto LSD. Before that's like LSD before it became a right you know, really a sort of a mainstream thing. So mainstream, to me, it was just so yeah. cool that those guys were also like, yeah, Dr. Strange, man. No, totally. You know? Well, yeah. and also, um, <laughs> there's a Pink Floyd cover. Yes. Oh, boy. You get What? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, no, no. There's a Pink Floyd cover. Fuck. I think it's metal, but it's mm. um, it, it, ha- it was a modulation of a Dr. Strange cover, and they had to reduce it a little bit oh, yeah, more yeah, than yeah. they intended. You know, um, that's you can um, see the saucer of secrets, right? Isn't it saucer, saucer, of, saucer of secrets? Second yeah, 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 exactly. Right. No, but but you know, and the other thing is like to speak to that kind of uh, the time, the zeitgeist, how big pop art was. We haven't even talked about that. You know, like Warhol and all that pop yeah. art and comic books. And you were saying, you know, there's the uh, the guy Pilart, Pilar yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. His Pravda comic book is 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 referenced in the film. Mm-hmm. Comic books were a huge pop art influence. And they really, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that Definitely. was a driving force of like, the look whatever. and yeah. feel of, of, yeah, like a lot of pop art 60s. So it's a great choice for them to do that. And um, yeah. actually, I thought you were going to talk about, let's talk about maybe the first part a little bit well, here. Just, uh, let me just jump in real quick and say, I was oh. also thinking about Evan, like during the art, because there's a guy, there's a Peter Blake <laughs> image of doc this like wrestler named dr yeah. k torture yeah and i was like oh shit shout out to uh dark side of uh dr k torture yeah She's well gonna- they there's that great <laughs> shot in uh, the second half when it's just a close-up on a wrestling magazine and yeah. <laughs> and that too felt very kind of i don't know scorpio rising or something like where you're just sort yeah, of seeing this of ephemera erotic subtext yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah and yeah, it's just it's it, just cool i love that touchables like a big part of the story is is wrestlers Oh, maybe you wow. haven't, have you not seen it? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen no, it's it. wrestling. Uh, so it's like uh, mm. whatever British, you know, like uh, oh. yeah, pro wrestling. Wow, I got to um, check that out. But but what I was going to say is like uh, 
you know, again, this is a fool's errand trying to do this. <laughs> but I just wanted to give a shout out to something that might be getting less love here is the first part. Yeah. And critics have pointed out, like, this was a, when a lot of people walked out of this film. This mm -hmm. was really reviled by the mainstream. It was early on, and it's that scene where the guy, um, they're like really, you know, dressing down this guy who doesn't pay off his money or whatever, and like they're shaving his head. Yes. And it's kind of ritualistic, and it's shot kind of sexually and lovingly, like close ups mm -hmm. of like shaving this guy's head. And then they just pour acid on the limousine. Mm -hmm. And some critic once said, like, this literally stinks. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I can smell the ugly, like, like there's like aftershave mixing with like burning, like a yeah. acrylic paint. It's like, it just felt like, like so unpleasant and so harsh. Uh, again, we're all, you know, it's 2024 20, and like every horrible vile thing has gone through in front of us, you know, but this was still really quite shocking. What is happening in that moment? Is he, is he being like, like, what's happening to him in that moment? Is he getting just like high off that fumes, or what's what is? Uh, it's, uh, they're just, uh, you know, they're, do, they're they're scaring the shit out of him, right? Like, so next weird. is you're dead, but right yeah. now we're everyone's gonna know that we were here yeah. because your limbo's jacked and you can see it, and your head shaved and you can see it, and so it's just a visual example of like we were here and uh, you're not gonna Supposedly do this again. They, Supposedly they got that story from David Litvinoff's like real life, like he'd actually been a part of something like that, or sure, you know, like he was a mobster, the guy who played Harry Flowers. Yeah. Wow, that's so crazy. That's so crazy. Yeah, it's no, just totally a very harsh scene. It is yeah. super harsh. I mean, there's some amazing moments in that first half. The uh, as I mentioned, the the splattering the the red paint and just the hand, the oh. frenetic handheld camera of that fight scene feels very ahead of its time. Definitely, also like I said, point blank inspired, but just kind of takes it to the next level. Uh, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, just it, it is a really kind of underrated, I think, part of the movie. Yeah, in a and way. James it's, Fox um, is It amazing. shows a lot of interesting control on the part of both directors, too, because, like, yeah. and I think that's what we're, what we're seeing is sort of the film that kind of got away mm -hmm. uh, from us because of LSD and, like, you know, Godard right. and, like, just sure. huge inspiration, which is okay. There's some it's deeper just, themes that there. Was, uh, sorry? Oh, there's just some deeper themes like that that are not addressed. That that they start down that road, they're pretty interesting. With like he's got that childhood friend or whatever, like the backstory who he's got a childhood friend, and he feels sort of like he's like harsher on that guy. It's like a, you know, I don't know, just yeah. being in, uh, tied to like your own identity and stuff, and like I don't know. Well, anyway, yeah, and the yeah, act no, that you're putting I, on, I, I feel like an really, act, you know, Ch whatever, Chaz you know. is hiding out from the film performance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Like he's like, and he, and he and he has a misadventure in hiding out from like a normal film with a normal story. More, <laughs> I love that. You know what I mean? It's I love like, that. And then it's like, or 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 you know, the film takes acid, and it's just like, yes. what was I talking about? Who gives a shit? You yeah, right. like, <laughs> like the world is screaming right now. Like who yeah. cares about everyone and all these characters and names? right, right, and uh, it just dissolves. Mm -hmm. Right, but also the main sort of theme, if you will, with this movie, I feel like is a uh, largely part of you know violence through performance you know is a big yes. part of what this movie is and i also feel like um there's that one line that i think it's anita says in the movie where she quotes and she says you know the only performance that makes it that makes it all the way is the one that achieves madness you know mm -hmm. and that is sort of what it is it's like we're going to break down the person. It almost is like a weird, oddly enough, self-help sort of situation with uh, it, well, James Fox, yeah. you know, which is... You a know, lot of people got into trouble, quote yeah. unquote, because there was a lot of ego death. Right, right, uh, right, right. With drugs, without drugs, just the, the zeitgeist at the time. But yeah, and that's very Antonin Artaud, you know. Yes, so, it is. Um, that quote yeah. is, it might as well have been from him. Sure. And yeah, what's might the be. name of the movie? Performance, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, and they're both like... You know, part of the theorem of the film, if you want to try to hang a, you know, a hook on it is, you know, we're all performing for each other and then ourselves and like, what is identity? And there is some, um, you know, sexual politics dynamics going on, the male and female, the anima, yep. the animus and stuff like that. Yep, but I yep. think the thing, film gets even further than that mm -hmm. into simply like the fundamentals of like what, what our identity is and how we are just playing roles and how uh, we get trapped in these roles and we watch a person um, who's burned out from their role, which is sort of the Sunset Boulevard rock star version of Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. and a guy who is falling apart for several reasons. Because the thing about Chaz 
it's one of those films where yes all this stuff happens to him you know he's given drugs and everything and experiences this, this the 60s but he also isn't doing so hot in the beginning like he's starting off pretty like dinged mm -hmm. as evidenced by that opening scene and there's again a lot of like repressed homosexuality yeah. happening yeah totally uh, in the first half and 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 it's addressed in memo uh from turner mm -hmm. you know they start getting into kind of like sexy male dancing kind of stuff <laughs> right like don't they all get into their underwear in, in, <laughs> i in, think it's all naked turner? yeah well yeah. i mean the gangsters do you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah he's yeah. like undressing them though like yeah as yeah. yeah exactly yeah. so but but again it's not even that simple in my my estimation it's it's beyond even that like you know m you know men have the female side and vice versa mm -hmm. like that's absolutely there and there's a great visualization of that one of the greatest oh the best one of the great shots in the movie yeah is the is the, is the, uh, the, the half face mirror yeah yeah of anita in the mirror and then him and it's just like there's so many brilliant mirror beautiful. thing you know mirrors as a th visual theme yeah. like every, the time, every time they use smashed. one you're kind of like wow you know and then the mirror is smashed mm -hmm. uh at some point, multiple times. <laughs> like, you see yeah. it in the sex scene at the beginning, like sort of the rough oh, sex yeah. scene. Okay, he's yes, like looking right. at himself, you know, and then you yeah. see it when Mick is introduced to him. Like you see Mick like reflected in the ceiling, and there's a time right. on the acid trip when like uh, Mick blocks him out by he blocks out uh, James Fox's character with the mirror, you know, and you see it, yes, you see Mick right. reflected, you know, right. and then you have the sex scene with Anita Pallenberg where he's like. Or like they're in the bed and she shows her body and his face in the mirror mm -hmm. or whatever you know there's so many great it's, things it's just that. so beautifully rendered like mm -hmm. so so this, but anyway if we're talking about like themes i think you know there's uh well what you know it was one of, it's not the worst um ad campaign no nope. it was vice period and versa <laughs> yeah great not bad. that's not yeah. bad you know <laughs> to try Amazing. to good. package this in some way it's so good I like yeah. that, you know, just all these, it puts all these themes together and puts them all out there for you to kind of absorb. But like, I don't know, like, you know, after the movie, I'm a little perplexed or whatever, but I don't know if it's one of those things where you're supposed to get it or you're supposed to understand it or if it's just like, you know, like, do I know what I am the walrus is about? You know, like there's mm -hmm. just sort of like all these, yeah. and like, do I know what naked lunch is about? You know, I feel like Burroughs is like an influence in here yeah. too. He's mentioned or Bob memo Dylan from there, Turner. Exactly. There's a you doctor know? called Dr. Burroughs in this, you know, it's like poetry and mm -hmm. you mentioned James Joyce. And mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, like, do, do we know what that's about? You know, I, so I think, uh, you know, I like that this is a piece of cinematic art that like has a lot of compelling ideas in it and is so affecting, but it's not like you were supposed to go like, Oh, it was all a dream. Yeah. You know, yeah. or there's some like, yeah. you know, silly it's thing like that. No, so. it's cool. And it's also such a great snapshot of the time period and yeah. all of these yeah. creative forces coming together who are from different walks of life. But you know, it's just such a unique time that I feel like only there was a brief window where a movie like uh, performance could exist. Months. Mm -hmm. Months. Like, oh, <laughs> like months before, <laughs> eh, not so much. Months after, no. Yeah. And it was just, it was a yeah. snapshot of a time. And, and again, my big takeaway is just that he was against the auteur theory. Yeah. And it's just, this is an ensemble piece and there's so many interesting people. It's not even that they're like incredibly talented necessarily. It's more like yeah. they're just coming from a really inspired place. And it's a kind of, we've talked about this before with other films. Uh, each person's getting really turned on by the project. Like we talked, like Texas Chainsaw, you know? Yes. Yeah. Like, like they get turned on by the project and they're giving their all yeah. and they care, which is yeah. so important. You can feel that everyone cares. Yeah. The mm -hmm. film music, the cinematography, mm -hmm. you know, the editing, yeah. like uh, the writing, the performances, everyone is so invested. Anita Pallenberg's recommending The Last Poets. Like, mm -hmm. you know, are there movies like that now? Um, you know, <laughs> what, what I mean is like inspire, inspi mm, inspired, yeah. bringing out the most of yourself and challenging yeah. yourself. I think everything, everywhere, well, all at once had a little bit of that vibe. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> that's the last thing I got to mention. <laughs> that's the performance of our. Oh shit, we're out of time. <laughs> What is it? Cheap. Uh, I guess I, I was just going to mention that memo from Turner is in Goodfellas too. That's, that's right. You know, last right. uh, little shout that's out right. there. Very cool. You know, I, I'm going to oh. propose something right now and I'm kidding, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm kidding, but why not do it uh, on two. the air? Okay. <laughs> How about at the end of the year, we say in a public poll, what film do you want us to do? the second hour <laughs> <laughs> like 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 uh, hour sure two hour two on... the sequel okay sure sure 
Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Well, because or, I want to put this as a candidate right now. Okay. I okay. could do another hour on mask, you know? Oh, sure. Absolutely, <laughs> dude. A hundred percent. All day. Yeah, of course. <laughs> another hour on Magnolia. No problem. Um, so sure. <laughs> we probably could. <laughs> and we'd still be, uh, you know, an hour short of the film's length. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. totally. uh, all right that was okay. great we that was fun Florida did it i apologize oh, shit. damn I, what i think we something that guy's a, that guy from star wars is in it too from return of the jedi you know the uh, admiral piet or whatever oh yeah the, yeah, uh, yeah yeah i saw mm-hmm. that british actor from yeah of course return of the jedi. which star wars connection he had to mention it so. yeah there you go um all right well that was one fucking hour on performance our best efforts there um i hope you enjoyed that uh very exciting pretty, uh camp pretty cool camp- movie really cool movie can't believe it took us this long to get there as well and shout out to i mean even though it's not purely a nicholas rogue film this is the fourth nicholas rogue <laughs> effort that we've covered <laughs> sure. on the channel maybe the most like out it. of any director maybe so, wait, so walk about walk about timing. don't look don't now. look now and this you know this and there yeah. might it's be gonna suck one. when we run out of uh rogue movies yeah i know oh, oh, he's he really is kind of the perfect one fucking hour director in a lot of ways a um, kind of yeah yeah so Anyway, uh, shout out to those episodes there in the archive. But let's talk about next week. We teased it at the top of the show. Episode 100, guys, is next week. It's a huge milestone here for the channel. Can't believe we made it to 100 episodes. It's pretty wild. Um, and then we're going to celebrate with the best way we know how, which is the clip show. We're going to do one fucking hour on one fucking hour. Uh, all of our favorite moments and yours uh, from the past 100 episodes that we're going and, to uh, relive. Some bloopers. Bloopers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's, part of, that's often part of a clip show. You know, We, we should play... Um, <laughs> We should definitely play uh, a clip from our our pilot, uh, some kind of monster, sure. uh, before we. <laughs> Brutal. Uh, <laughs> I think you released that. We did. We did. I just think of it, and like our voices are higher. Like, yeah, I know, right? Okay, so <laughs> this one starts off really cool. And it's like, yeah. like we're all like fourteen. Uh, characters are all wrong. Like, yeah, yeah, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't really pinned down my character yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> like, there's a there's an unreleased uh, episode that we did on some kind of monster that we just to test recorded, but we released it on the Patreon. So shout out if you want to check that right. out. It's only up in the Patreon, but maybe we'll feature a clip from that in the show. And um, <laughs> it's part of the story. Yeah. It's part of the story arc, man. So we're and of course all the guests we've had on. So we'll do a little you know fun clip show for uh next week one fucking hour on one fucking hour but if you but, have but again f- we want to emphasize like yeah. if anybody you yes. know, has a favorite moment or you know one they find amusing and wouldn't mind having us throw into the pile of our clip show like let us know let's hear about yeah it. or if there was a uh, some like you know relevatory uh observation we made about uh, a particular movie that made a impact on you or anything uh, definitely uh, share that too in the comments and we will, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll throw it up on the show. We'll have a lot of fun. It's going to be a fun sort of laid back episode for episode 100 and then we'll get straight back into business right with episode back 101. Work. Back to work. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Next exactly. hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Next hundred. <laughs> Holy shit. Let's go. So, um, all right, everybody. Well, or- thank you so much. Bill Beef. Yeah. <laughs> Orange peel, babe. Um, so, all right, everybody. We will uh, see you for episode 100. Thanks again. Uh, but, of course, we can't leave you uh, without your beautiful, wonderful moment of zen. He kind of looks like Donald Campbell a little, little bit. A little bit. What? Um, One more time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No? Okay. Just, Moment. I know. I'm no. just <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you. Have a good rest of your week, and we'll catch you for episode 100, man. Get ready. Get psyched. All right. Take care. So long, everybody. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. One of the most electrifying, controversial, and original talents of the cult-ridden 60s, Mick Jagger epitomized the appeal of the new young and at the same time became a target for the distrust of their elders. But today, in the 70s, Mick Jagger is dedicated to finding complete fulfillment for his creative endeavors in many areas. Turning his considerable energies and talents to the motion picture screen, Jagger devoted many months to perfecting his abilities as an actor before attempting his first film role in performance. Donald Camel, who co-directed the dramatic film with Nicholas Rogue, says Jagger is one of the most stimulating talents he has ever seen. Jagger makes great use of a unique device called a Moog synthesizer to write and then record his music. Named after its inventor, young New Yorker R.A. Moog, the synthesizer is an electronic machine capable of reproducing any sound in the world. 
By manipulating its keys and plugs, a skilled operator can program any sound desired. The resulting unique sound combination is a highlight of a Jagger musical composition. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And I want to tell you I had a great time. And y'all come back, you hear? Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> That was wicked, man.